All right, you may not know it, but that word says nomenclature. <laughs> So, still don't know what it means. No man. What things are called? That's why I said that. Nomenclature. Or what things are called. What we call things. Or words. Words we're going to use. So one word we're going to use is terms. Okay, terms. I know, right? Terms. There we go. Is that like one of those ATM machines? Terms? What? Yes. Automatic ATM machine. All right. Cam ground. All right, pistons are cam ground, which means they're not a circle. They just look like a circle, but they are not a circle. Uh, the cross section, <clears throat> perpendicular, that's a better cross section, perpendicular. Oh, we'll go with it. Cross section perpendicular is greater than in than in line with piston pin. That is a terrible way to say it. I'll see if I can say it worse than in line with piston pin. At room temperature, the piston pin area this way, if I measured it this way, at room temperature is smaller than this way. So if I measure this with a micrometer and I measure it like this, it will be bigger or smaller than this way. So the diameter at the piston pin is less than the diameter Yes. Diameter. <laughs> at piston pin is less, less. <laughs> smaller forgot is the rim side the bolt side at you try for room temp then at 90 sand are already now made it more complicated than 90 degrees to piston pin All right, why that is, which has more mass? Up and down or this away? This away. This away, yes. Well, that makes sense because, you know, room temp is at 90 degrees. It's a little warm, it's a little warm, but... Yeah, sir, I thought room temp was 75. All right, the reason why is because at room temp, this way is going to be bigger and this way is smaller because this has more mass and more mass when it heats up expands more so at operating temperature it's going to expand more horizontally the way i'm holding it than it will vertically therefore at operating temperature instead of looking like an egg which it is you just can't tell it becomes a circle, a circle. yeah so rate of expansion is more with mass. I rejected like a hundred pistons before I figured that out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm sure you threw a bunch of cylinders away too because they weren't perfect. Oh ah, yeah, they choked and stuff. I threw them away. So uh, cam ground provides better fit at operating temps. I'm hoping that you noticed when you measured your piston that the instructions told you exactly where to measure it. And it did say 90 degrees to the piston boss, didn't it? But it didn't say why. It just said to do that. That's the why. Because it matters. If you would have measured it just under the piston pin boss, which would be a logical thing to do, to measure it right here, right there, right there, right there, instead of right here, right there, it would be like, well, totally different measurements. So, so when you where you measure it on the height of the piston pin, that, that can change. Or I don't know how to say, like, up and down? Give this. 
<laughs> you might think. You measure here or here? Oh, um, I measure right down here. Oh, it depends. Actually, I'm sorry. It does depend on what, um, because sometimes you're supposed to measure it here at the land. So it tells you exactly where to measure it. Yeah, it tells you skirt, then I'm going to do it down here on the skirt. It tells you up at the lands, do it up at the lands. Um, I don't know about this one. This sounds like something I picked up at the, you know, where. Um, allows more where I put in all my notes that this guy said, so some of it's like, I don't know. More aware of the piston where thrust is greatest. Which is like saying, oh, no, 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 we made it wider right here because there's more thrust and that's going to rub on the cylinder and that has greater wear capabilities. But if that were true and this were rubbing on the cylinder, then we would have a loss of material, which would mean what in the oil? Yeah, and metal shavings. Bunch of metal shavings in the oil. That's not good. So I don't know. I'm going to write that, but it's like, yeah, I don't know about that. Maybe I shouldn't write that. I'm just like, whatever. Balance. What is the balance difference between them? What's that? Yeah, it looks like it. Maybe I'll just change that to... Uh... Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, it should have went like this. Nomenclature, terms... And then this should have been I, cam ground, C slide, there you go. Back to square one. Yes. <laughs> then we talked about cam ground. Now we're talking about balance. What would the circlip do if, if we, like, in the distance to have them? Is it just like a. Like, what he said? Balance. Well, you should already know this one. Each piston should be no more than. One half an ounce or 14 grams. One quarter ounce. In weight. That would be seven grams. And that was according to uh, Wild and Crows. That's my source there. <laughs> Although TCM states, so that's a textbook, so textbook. So textbook. So take it with what you want. Um, but th that's a pretty good, that's a really good book. So they got it from something, and I just don't know what. Um, TCM is how much? This you know. One half ounce or 14 grams. 14 grams. Um, K R O E S. So we're going to stick with that. TCM, that's uh, much better data. Half ounce, 14 grams, uh, opposing. So the cross ones have to be no more than that, and the back ones, no more than that. So, But from, si from front to back, they can vary. So it's just opposing has to be within a half of an ounce. Um, yes. So what's the secret to ordering a set of pistons that okay, match set? Match set? Oh, yeah, BP, you say, you say, balance pack, no. BP. Uh, the, I, at least I could do that out of AVL. So we had types of pistons. We had, we talked about this already. We had the flat. We had the recessed. 
We had the cup. Had the dome. And the truncated. L. Other points. And I have two other points, so it makes sense that I put other points. Uh, let's see. Newer pistons. This came as a bit of a straw. Let me see. Do I have? Is that why this picture was there? Let me see. No, it's not. How about this picture? No. All right. Newer pistons have a molly coating on it. Molybdenum disulfide. And so all of this area right here to about where this little dish out starts, and then sometimes I've seen it around here, is black. So when you get it, it's all black. That's a, a lubricant. Well, lead, I can't say that word at all. Molly, ben, bendulum, disulfide coating on the skirt. So. Molly bendulum? Yes. Molly bendulum motor? Molly bendulum. Damn. That'll help, thanks. Well, no, I remember it. <laughs> all right. Pro molly? No, not that. No? <laughs> What, do, does the piston pin cap rub against this little bit? Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about that next. Not next, in a while. Uh, newer pistons have uh, black. Black, I just call it Molly, but it's. Coating on skirt. And have steel belts in the pistons grooves. So I remember when they came out with steel belts. Here's one. You can see the color difference in it. A steel belt in there. Because what happens is there's so much pressure on the top rings, and it's just aluminum. The top ring, you know, when you're going up, it wants to flex down. You know, it's compressing everything. Then you have the combustion process forcing it down. So that's got another way. So you constantly have that, that ring wanting to float around. And it wasn't that uncommon to take a piston out. You have these huge ring gaps. It just so wore out right there. And so they came out with these steel belts. Well, now we have more mass, and I think the steel belts must have heated up more and expanded a little bit more, because I remember uh, light combing. So we, you guys know about choke. Choke is when referencing. Choke is always talking about what happens up here at the head. So if we have a choked cylinder, it gets smaller it's choked up at the top if it's tapered it goes out that way cylinders are made with either choke or straight taper is always aware that's something you don't want so uh continental they weren't too aggressive on their choke at all but light coming was super aggressive um i want to say that the choke choke is like 0.012 i mean it's a lot and then when they came out with steel belted pistons, we had to knock that off and we had to, the choke change from that to about 004. So it was a whole lot less. That's where Continental already had a lot less. So, um, so once the steel belts came out, it went a whole lot less. Uh, let's see. Removal of piston. <coughs> I say removal, removal of cylinder. So always remove cylinder when piston is at what position? TDC. TDC. It doesn't matter if it's TDC compression or, I mean, they tell you to do a compression, but it doesn't matter as long as it's up top. Why is that? Easier to. It, it is. So it's on bang. Shit doesn't bang into the crankcase? 
Uh, more than anything, it's to prevent it from breaking the rings, but also if you've got it down at bottom dead center and this thing is kind of tucked away inside of the crankcase, well, it's harder to get to the piston pin. It's down there. You're going to have to bring it out anyway, but sometimes a lot of, a lot of you have the ring down here, uh, oil scraper ring, which we don't have on these, but we'll talk about the oil scraper ring down there. It gets caught on the crankcase and it breaks. And so... But if you're going to replace it anyway, it's not a problem, other than the fact you got to go find the rest of it and fish it out of the, out of the engine. Um, so just remember to do that. So I don't do that. Uh, piston rings. Every time I do that, you can say, you did what in your rings? Um, piston rings. What is the purpose? Many purposes. Many purposes. What are my many purposes? I Provides can think of at least one. Compression. What, what? Provides the seal for compression. Provides the fuel for compression? Seal. Okay. That'll take. Provides a gas seal. Provides a gas seal. All right, so something that kind of bugs me, I'll tell you. Um, yeah. We do compression tests on aircraft engines, which I usually talk about in this one. We'll see if I have time for that. But one of the things that happens is you, you do, when we do a compression test, you put air into the cylinder, and then you have a second gauge that tells you how much air stays in. So one gauge tells you how much is going in, goes through an orifice, how much stays in. There's almost always leakage through a cylinder. And so one of the things is they say, well, if you have leakage in the cylinder past the rings, it could be because the gaps are all lined up. I'll buy that, but air is pretty good at turning around, turning a corner. So I've always had a problem with why can't the air go through one gap, go around through the next gap? Why is it when they're lined up, it you know? So I don't that's, know. That's a, that, you think it would be different during a during a combustion than it would be with just constant pressure? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because at least with the combustion, it might slow the velocity of the air down, or the or the expanding gas down might slow down a bit. Going through the like kind of like a ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It slows it down at least. So maybe it makes sense when it's But not when you're doing a static compression test. So air will get by the rings. That is just a fact. We call that blow by. That's what happens. There is no perfect seal here. So for that, I say so this is why. Oops. You can get close, but that's just not going to happen. <laughs> 78. There's always a little, little tiny leakage. Yours when you did 20? Because you don't have rings. When you're doing out there, there's no rings. This is why we have a, have a crankcase breather. So that blow by gets down in the rings. That is combustion gases. It's nasty stuff. It gets in the oil. It makes the oil kind of blackish. Um, it, it pressurizes the crankcase, but the crankcase has a breather, which has to dump that pressure overboard. One of the tricks of the trade is to figure out how much pressure your crankcase has is to put a low pressure gauge on it. And we happen to have low pressure gauges in the aircraft called the airspeed indicator. So as people take an old uh, unused airspeed indicator, which is just a pressure gauge really and put it in there and you can see and talk about how many miles per hour you're getting in the crankcase which is how much pressure you get because um, yeah sometimes in flight the, the uh, breather will be in such a way that air is actually coming in and pressurizing the crankcase from the outside and so now you have pressure coming up the breather which it was supposed to be going that way but now it's going this way because of misplacement and so all kinds of problems can happen and so then when that happens it starts to blow the nose seal out the front of the engine so then that blows oil all the air, the windshield, and then you crash. So not a good thing. It take much time to push that seal out. Uh, they used to just be pressed in. They're getting more into gluing them in now. So it's no seals? Uh, yeah, the no seal. Yeah, not a big one. I got that kind of no seal too. So yeah, breather must be open. Mm -hmm. Feel the same way as me. Or excessive crank cave pressure. Yeah, C -S -S excessive crank pressure. 
Bitcoin. Will result. <laughs> uh, fun fact, crankcase breathers are just aluminum tubing. It, so like the breathers in the front of the engine, so you have a hose that just goes across the top of the engine to around and then next to the firewall you'll have a tube, 3 8 inch tube or something that runs down um, and then out the bottom. But if you look up, usually about that far, you're going to see what looks like damage done to the uh, breather. And that's normal. You should see that. That looks like something punctured it. In fact, that's what it is. Like if somebody cut, cut halfway through it and then pushed, pushed it in a little bit. It's called a whistle slot. And the purpose of a whistle slot is that it's a little bit of a venturi. And so it draws warm air from around the engine into that whistle slot and down so that you have warm air so that the tip of the tube does not freeze over. Huh. Yeah. So why don't we just have the crank race breather ventilating into like your intake manifold? And so then you would be pulling a vacuum on it. Oh, so the oil and by combustion byproducts go back into your carburetor and into the engine? Mm -hmm. I don't that's want that. That's an emissions thing, bro. That's not yeah. a <laughs> like yeah. that that catch can. can. From pressurization of it. No, that's, yeah, that's yeah. just a smog yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. No, don't, don't give them that idea. They're already yeah. trying to take <laughs> away <laughs> my gas. <laughs> I need a cat on your plane. <laughs> there is a, I don't want to call it a great book because it's super dry. Uh, but it's really fantastic information that um, was written by a local fella, he, um, John Schwanner. He owned Sacramento Sky Ranch. And I think his dad was seriously into aviation. So he was second generation. I think John was an engineer, uh, went to school to become an engineer. One of those brilliant guys that like sometimes couldn't see exactly. Like There was a story about him how in the hose shop he got pissed off because they always had to grab the crescent wrench and change the size to fit the hose, and it takes time to do that. And he's like, you know, I'm tired of having to change the crescent wrench all the time. What we need to do is get like eight of these things and weld them to the right size for each hose. So you just pick one up. And so it's like, yeah, the call that a wrench. See, that's he's the kind of guy who thinks so far ahead that he forgets to look behind him a little bit. But um, super nice guy, I thought. Uh, anyways, nice to me. But anyway, he wrote this book called The Sky Ranch Engineering Manual, which... Um, Sadly, it's in a weird print now, and it, I lost my original copy, got it, and it's like all formatted funky. But anyway, um, he commented on, uh, because one of the things we do is we have an oil separator. Um, well, I won't get into that, but anyway, it, it connects um, the intake around to, the, to an oil outlet. And he's like, well, that's kind of like connecting your ass to your mouth. <laughs> he's like, why would you do that? <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Purpose number two, rings uh, prevents excessive oil from getting into combustion chamber. From getting into, getting into uh, combustion chamber. And we already talked about the fact we want some oil, we just don't want too much. And lastly, we already talked about this. What do they do? Rings? Purpose? Compression. That was number one. Seal thing? Seal the cylinder? Cooling. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Conduct heat. From piston to cylinder wall. All right, piston rings, the material. What are they made out of? Cast iron. Steel. Steel? They're hardened, huh? They're super hard. hard. High grade, um, no, high grade cast iron. Um, brittle as fuck. Yes, they are, so it would be hard. Cast iron. Not the top, not the compression rings. Okay, so here's the, there's a big deal about uh, rings. So high grade cast irons. So they are made out of, they're made out of cast iron. So there's, um, let me see, so compression rings, One, compression rings, that's the top two, compression rings 
may be chrome plated. So it's cast iron with chrome plating on the part that rubs against the cylinder wall. You never, never use chrome rings in a chrome cylinder. Chrome on chrome is very, very bad. It will eat each other up. I don't know. It must be. Obviously, it is. So chrome. Why? Much harder. Lasts a lot longer. So a chrome cylinder uses plain, plain rings only. And a, I'm going to say, I'll just say steel, steel cylinder. That's the barrel, the coating. Steel could be plain or nitrided. Um, plain or chrome rings. Is there an advantage or disadvantage to, to having steel cylinders or chrome cylinders or nitrated cylinders? Because it seems like why couldn't we get all three? So why would they do that? Yeah. Partly my opinion on that, it appears that all of the higher compression engines got nitrided and it added expense. All the lower horsepower, cheaper engines were plain steel, lower expense. Something I noticed. Don't know if that's the case. There was a period, well, yeah, so I'll talk about it now. I mean, it comes around. So when we talk about cylinder bo uh, barrel finishes, Chroming was a repair. So what happened is, you know, you go back to radial engines and you had a steel cylinder and you'd run the steel cylinder until it wore out and you go in and you measure it and you say this is beyond service limits. So instead of throwing it away, they came up with a process whereby they would put a chrome plating. This one's chrome plated on this and the chrome would be thick enough, say bore it way over, chrome plate it back to new, new standard, right? So that was a repair. Well, one of the uh, benefits of a chrome cylinder is it doesn't rust. Yeah. What the rings rub on. Yeah, it's, this, the whole thing is always made of steel. Right. The whole thing, well, what you're holding is the barrel. it is the barrel, yeah. And they're they're always made out of steel. But when I say a steel cylinder, I don't mean like what it's made out. I mean the the finish inside. So steel being nitrided or plain steel. So anyway, chrome doesn't rust. So engines that sat around for a long time didn't rust. Huge benefit. So. I know that engine manufacturers for a while offered this as an option. Well, you know, order a new cylinder or new engine. Would you like that engine with nitrided cylinders or chrome cylinders? So you got that option. And there was variations of this. Oh, I can get into variations later. But anyway, that was that's the thing. So chrome was a originally a, a fix. Then it became an option for new stuff. Is this still common? As a repair, yeah. That was yeah, but you wouldn't order that. I don't think they offered it new. I don't know anymore, to be honest with you. I wouldn't order a Chrome. Um, ECI, who was bought out, they had a different Sermonil. And so they were like aftermarket companies where ECI was offering either their steel through hardened or Sermonil, which is ceramic nickel, which I'll get into cylinders for a while. There was Surma, Surma Chrome and Surma Nil. That stuff was hard. Oh my God, that was still, Surma Nil was just insane. We had to buy, we had to buy special diamond bits to hone it. All right, so takeaway. I think it's a Q&A. Never use chrome rings in a chrome, chrome cylinder. cylinder. Steel cylinder, you can use both, plain or chrome, but there usually are chrome. At least the top one is. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, types of rings. Types of rings. Let me see. Do I have a I must? I must. I must. There we go. We go by the cross-sectional area, which you should figure out. That's what it means when you cut it and you look at the, or the oh, look at the space right there. Um, inlaid moly. So it's got a little bit of a moly right there inlaid. High strength chrome. You can see it's got a little thing right there. So it's got that's where it's chromed right there on the face only. That's not the whole thing is chrome. It's just chrome right there, and that chrome is what rubs against the cylinder. Um, I guess that's their abbreviation. We don't use that, so um, I don't know. I wouldn't. These names are not something that is like common to what we use. Um, what do you want? This right here. This is common. So I call them square, chrome, plain. So that'd be the big ones. Um, square ring. Either that one or that one. Those are square. Um, this one I just call square with a chamfer on the back. But it's mostly square because it's just it's this area right here that I care about. Because why you need to know this is when you're measuring them, how they fit in the cylinder. And so all of these right here are square on the top, and they're all going to fit the same. So they're much easier to measure. But plane goes what kind of cylinder? Finish? Chrome. Plane, mostly chrome. Can, it can go neither. Uh, and chrome goes in steel. 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 All right. So that's the big takeaway. Then, um, I don't know about this stuff here. It's like, um, I've seen them radial use some weird stuff. Um, okay. This will be important. Taper face. It is tapered. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Then Lycoming likes to use the word keystone and half keystone. They want you to know these words because of the way they're measured when they go in. But the takeaway is they're, they're, they're angled. So this one's flat with a, I think that's when you guys have, half keystone, right? Yeah. Yep, full keystone is where both, both of them are. So those are the different type of rings. You get square, really square and keystone, and then tapered face. These are the compression rings and or scraper ring, which would be the fourth ring. I'll talk about that. So types of rings. Well, they're identified by cross-sectional area. Um, let's see. <laughs> split. They are split. There's always a split. Split to allow installation. That is usually a butt joint. Which means it's just two squares that are, they're not like overlaid, half overlaid, or some sort of interlocking something or another. Just a butt joint, and well, you've seen just like yours are. Um, let me talk about this. Yes, I'll get around to that. Okay, usually a butt joint. Let me see, number three uh, compression rings. Which one are the compression rings? Compression rings. Um, Top one, two, or more. Some of the older engines I worked on had like, geez, three compression rings. They had five rings total. One, two, three, four. Yeah, five rings total on them. Um, maybe chrome plated. And I've already said it, never use a chrome plated ring on chrome cylinders. Uh, after the compression ring comes the oil control ring. Uh, you and that is used to control, used to control oil into the cylinder. This is a usually a two-piece 
ring. I kind of wish I had one to show you, but I don't appear that I do. So if you look at a cross-sectional area of an oil control ring, it would look something like this. Stop it. With all kinds of holes and stuff over here going through maybe. And so this is the part that goes against the cylinder wall right there. And then back here is like a spring looking thing. Sometimes with another wire and in, in, in it'll hold it together. So first you install this, this wire round coil in on the on the cylinder in the ring groove and then the oil control ring goes on top of it. And when I do that, I uh, make sure that um, split split and ring is 180 from split in ring. Everything's got to have a split to get it on. Uh, can you follow me on that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you kind of got lost in that one, just grab me in lecture or lab tomorrow. And go, what the hell are you talking about? And I'll be happy to show you. Uh, let me see. The oil drains through holes in the piston. Let's see, we've got oil holes in there. Yeah, we do. If you look at that, you can see a big one right there. Another big one over here, another big one there. So these are pretty good sized holes. Yeah. Which way does it flow through those? Back into the engine or from the engine into the I think the engineer figures that out. Because that kind of plays into the next thing. So it could go either which way. I'm not 100% certain. I believe it goes out. But I could be a little wrong on that. Yes? The oil rings that was super brittle? They are super brittle. When you bump them, installing them, you crack them, and then they break in operation. So it's one of those things where it's uh, kind of an honor system. You know, when you bump one, you got to be brave enough to say, I bumped this and broke it, even though it looks 100% fine. You can't pull it back and go, eh, it looks fine. You bumped it, you broke it. It's just whether you can see it right now or it's going to break in operation, but it's going to break. How hard do you have to, is, is it like, oh man, I just barely kissed it on... That cylinder. doesn't usually happen. When people are installing cylinders in, it's a lot of pressure because you're holding the rings and you have to move. And that's, you have a ring compressor wrapped around the piston, which is rather tight. And then you've, you're trying to get your cylinder on it and you're kind of pushing hard. And so it slips and the two compression go and then you just time it wrong and then the, the oil control pops out. So you're hitting it you're hitting it pretty hard just by the way you do it it's it doesn't happen that you're just no it just doesn't work that way um yeah so the way i've always thought of it in my head and i i hesitate to say yes it is that way because i don't know for a fact but in my head it's always been oil goes from the wall to the ring out this way and out that way and the reason why i think that is because after the oil control ring, we have the oil scraper ring. <clears throat> Which is optional. It's not optional for you. It's just if it's got one, you gotta put it. But it's not something that you always see. You see it every now and then. It's like on what engines? Well, I know on radials, all have them. Uh, the inverted six cylinders would all have them, but um, it's hard to say, it's kind of hit and miss with um, flat engines. It's like not too common, but they are out there. So oil scraper is located really low. So it's located on the skirt. Located down on the skirt. Uh, it, so the oil ring, we'll look at it this way. Just, just stick with me on this one. It's kind of like they built an engine, they ran it, and said, oh crap, we are burning on a brand new engine, a quart every hour. Unacceptable, what are we gonna do? We did something wrong, some of the engineering just kind of backfired, the way we're spraying the oil. I know, we're gonna put an oil scraper ring down here, and it's gonna work to scrape oil out of the cylinder and back into the engine. So, burns too much oil, the oil control ring wasn't able to handle it, so put a scraper ring down here to help scrape the oil away. Got it? Because it was burning 
too much oil. Well, okay, so we got another group, they designed their engine, and they're like, hey, hey, you burned too much oil, and then 50 hours later, their top end is completely wore out and they have no more compression. Why? They didn't get enough oil. So what do they do? They do the same thing, but backwards. They cut in an oil scraper ring, put it in the other way around, and scrape oil up into the cylinder barrel. Now, while that may sound a little weird, now let's think about a radial engine. Yeah, it's going to have a lot of bottom on. So the bottom cylinders are getting oil. too much oil, so they have to scrape uh -oh. out. But the top cylinders don't get enough, so they have to scrape in. 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 Well, that presents a small problem, because when you're installing rings on a, on a piston, if you have brand new rings, which you should, if you take them off, throw them away, you have brand new rings, it's real easy to tell how they go. Um, Superior was just genius in doing this. When you bought rings from Superior, when you bought rings from Lycoming or Continental, you just got a ring. And you're like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? Uh, Cotton, uh, Superior, they would have a nice little cardboard thing that would open up like some sort of Chinese food thing. They would have a, all the rings that would say, Top compression, number two compression, oil control, oil scraper. And it would have a little card in it that would say the gap and the side clearance, everything should be. You didn't have to guess. It was awesome. It was right there. And, you know, and flip it over and have this. What goes in this kind of engine? You could verify what kind of engine you had. Um, and they all have the part number and then the word top written on it. So you would install every one of them. So when you got done looking at it, you could look at it right here and read the part numbers on every one because this is part numbers go up and this assuming the cylinders on the bench went up all right but then you get into the scraper yeah this happened to be why they're called superior maybe because the parts were better by a long shot um but in some engines so you're going to get the scraper and it's going to have the part number and say top and it'll say install with top down and so you know that's when designed to scrape away and so you'd have to turn it around to see the part number here and then some of them you have to go here, so you have to follow the directions. Some radial engines say install the scraper ring facing up on cylinders one, this, that, and the other, these, and it'll say install it the other way on these. So you have to watch the directions on that. Some scrape up, some scrape out. Some engines all scrape out, some engines scrape in, some engines scrape half and half. So you gotta make sure you know what you're doing. Um, so maybe used to scrape oil in or out. Not both, it's one or the other, the way you install it. Um, so always install per manufacturer instructions. So when they send you that little card, that is considered like an acceptable, accepted or approved Yeah. Uh, well, it is because it referenced a master manual that you had access to that had the same dimension, so it was a copy of that. Um, some rings, well, scraper rings, some scraper. Scraper rings are installed with top toward the bottom. which is to say upside down. Uh, let's see. Yep, we got that. All right, so I suppose I got to quit for now. Huh? Mm -hmm.